Our topic tonight is human trafficking. And I looked on Google uh, to get uh, a definition, and the very first word that popped out and the very first website that I happened to tap on just translated it as slavery. Um, and they then went on to say that between 21 million and 30, uh, 30 million men, women, and children are enslaved today. That means there are more slaves now than during all the years of the entire transatlantic slave trade combined. Then I was inspired when they, I noticed just a little bit farther down there was uh, President Obama's remarks, and I'm going to quote him. He said, it ought to concern every person because it is a debasement of our common humanity. It ought to concern every community because it tears at our social fabric. It ought to concern every business because it distorts markets. It ought to concern every nation because it endangers public health and fuels violence and organized crime. I'm talking about the injustice, the outrage of human trafficking, which must be called by its true name, modern slavery. Well, tonight, we have three local speakers who will describe the issue of human trafficking as they see it, and they will each speak for 15 minutes. But we have a five-minute bonus speaker as well, who will be introduced after, um, at the end of the speaking by uh, Leslie Briner. And we're also, let's see, we also, you will notice that there are cards on the seats, um, and please use those to write a question you would like to have the panel members answer during the uh, question and answers at the end of the program. We also ask you to talk with uh, the co-sponsors of this forum. I see some of them right over here at the end if you have not already done so. Thank you very much. So, first speaker is Leslie Briner. She is a human trafficking and education consultant. She has a master's in social work from the University of Washington. She has worked in programs serving homeless families youth with developmental disabilities, foster care youth, and since 2005 with commercially sexually exploited youth. She served as program director of youth services at SAGE, that stands for Standing Against Global Exploitation, in San Francisco from 2005 to 2007. Relocating to Seattle, she consulted for the City of Seattle's Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault Prevention Division, and she developed a training program to respond to sexually exploited youth. In 2010, she joined Youth Care, charged with implementing the bridge continuum of services for sexually exploited youth in Seattle. Leslie, thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's nice to see so many faces here on a Thursday night. Um, so I want to do it first because what I really want to do is provide you a little bit about the landscape of what this looks like. I think when we hear the terms human trafficking, we have um, sort of this narrative in our head of what this is about. And in some cases, that narrative is true. Um, but what I want to spend a little bit of time talking about is the different types and ways of exploitation that we're seeing in our community, and a little bit of context about how that has changed dramatically in the 10 years I've been doing this, and how it is continuing to change, specifically facilitated by the internet. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about services and what's available, kind of what we've learned as far as providing services for this population, and then um, end with kind of what we can do or how we can think about this differently to interrupt the next generation of this from happening. So one of the things that I wanted to spell right off the bat is that, uh, well, and, and to say that I work in the context of domestic trafficking, right? So what I'm talking about are the youth on the streets of Seattle and Tacoma and Chicago and Los Angeles and New York and all across our country who are exploited in various ways through the commercial sex trade. Now, when I started 10 years ago, the vast majority of youth out there were kind of this narrative of the pimp-involved girl. They were young, they were disproportionately from the foster care system, they were disproportionately people that were impacted by other forms of poverty, systematic harm, and discrimination. And they were exploited in some kind of predictable ways, largely through being recruited by an older person, often through a romantic relationship, and being exploited uh, on the streets of both large and small cities. 
And then a number of years ago, this happened, right? And if you look at the data of what's out there, we're still using data from 2001 and 2003 that started before the first iPhone even came on, on the market. And why, this, why is this relevant? And how does, the, how does this get to the point I'm trying to make? Uh, the answer to that is that when this started, this happened on a street. You could go down Denny, right, Belltown, Pack Highway South, Aurora. It was known as the track, and it was where the vast majority of pros the prostitution end of the commercial sex trade occurred. Well, with this, rapidly in the last 10 years, what we've seen is the move of the commercial sex trade off the street and through the internet, which is an online, unregulated, unfettered online marketplace. And what that did was really change the way that both victims, people that promote, and people that buy engage with the commercial sex trade. So nowadays, we do still have those young people who are young and generally have a history of harm who are being exploited by pimps. But I want to talk about a couple of other different kinds, because part of what I'm trying to um, set in this landscape is that there's lots of different ways that youth get exploited. And the frame of trafficking really, I think, has some limitations. And let me give you an example of that. So a 13-year-old, the difference between now and when I started is that a 13-year-old girl if she was found in a hotel room with a 35-year-old person, hopefully everybody responding to that situation, from the law enforcement to the prosecutor to the service providers, is going to see that young person as the victim and see the adults responsible as traffickers or um, people um, committing commercial sexual abuse of a minor, which is what we call it here. However, the 15-year-old boy who's kicked out of his home because his parents suspect that he's gay or he's fleeing abuse or violence, who's being traded amongst <laughs> adult men in our community, is really not so much in that trafficking frame. And we're seeing lots and lots of different kinds of ways that youth are exploited through the commercial sex trade that don't fit that original story. So we see gang-based trafficking here. That's a huge trend in the last five years. And some of the nuance of that is that youth are part of this collective that is exploiting them. It is different than that sort of romantic relationship that they might have with a perpetrator. We see youth exploited by their families, both formally and informally, uh, through prostitution as the family business, or when economics, poverty, lack of access, um, the access to child takes on a commercial, uh, for the purposes of sexual abuse, takes on a commercial component. We see um, what I'm referring to as peer-to-peer -peer exploitation, which is kind of what it sounds like, right? There's no adults involved in these kinds of scenarios, but it's where older or more powerful, um, generally young men, are approaching their younger or socially less powerful peers and offering them money for sex in the context of the school settings and outside of kind of school type activities. And what I take from that is that young men really are learning the behavior of buying sex at a younger age. Um, you know, there used to be some of that that would happen, uh, but I think that it is really becoming an increasing trend. And I don't mean this to be alarmist, right? I, you know, I think sometimes it can sound that way, but really what I want people to do is understand how how youth interact with the internet, what youth culture kind of teaches them, and the really mixed messages it sends. So as we are out there having, you know, a movement around this issue, local Seattle High School in 2012 had a pimp and ho theme for their homecoming dance. So kids are out there, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So kid, kids are out there hearing these very, very mixed messages about the themes and, and the, the, the um, Th this world, right? On one hand, this is you know something that, that they should stay away with, but on the other hand, it's something that we very much culturally accept and promote, right? The term pimp in the last 10 years has gone from being a noun that describes a person that does a thing to a verb that means to promote or improve something, right? So all of this sends very mixed messages to kids, and rather than kind of go these fear-based routes, I really think that we need to be talking with young people about these issues in a, in, a, in a really more empowering way because they have they they have unfettered access to this. So one of the other things that we see is more youth who work what we refer to as independently, what sometimes they refer to as self-managed, because uh, they have awesome language to describe their experiences. Uh, and really what this is is what it sounds like. It's youth who have been taught or learned how to access the commercial sex trade often primarily as a means of survival, who are not being exploited by that third party, right? And this gets real complicated when we, as we don't really have a shared definition about does trafficking require this third party exploiter or does trafficking happen at the hands of the adult person who purchases access to a child. 
so in this, uh, and just to give you a sense of kind of what this looks like, because I don't think this is as well understood, or as a 15-year-old youth, um, this was a story I heard last year, who was sitting at a bus stop. And a car drives, it's raining outside, and a car drives past, and she doesn't think much of it. The car rolls around the corner and this time stops and says to the young person, do you need a ride somewhere? And she said, no, 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 I'm good, I'm gonna catch the bus. And so he says, okay, well, do you wanna make some money? And she said, how much money? He said, 100 bucks, get in the car. And so she's retelling this story to her case manager, right? And, 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 we're, and we're horrified, right? We're horrified as we're hearing this, I would imagine. And she says this in a very sort of cavalier way that that first time, it just it wasn't so bad. So the next day, I went back to that bus stop. And instead of looking at my phone, I watched the cars as they drove past. And in a very simple, perhaps somewhat chance interaction in that case, uh, she learned the basic sort of premise of how this works. And I think, and, and I'm not, I get the luxury of not having to speak tonight to the issue of buyers because my esteemed colleague Val Ritchie is going to do that. Because a lot of people then go to, well, you know, who are these guys? So here's another sad reality. This is my prop. So in five minutes, any young person can take a picture, post it to Backpage, wait five minutes for the first of the 252 estimated buyers that will call in two hours, wait five minutes for that uh, and have that person book the hotel of their choice and work out of that hotel for as long as they want, need, or have to. And I know that this is really disturbing to hear, but I really do want to underscore that much of this is about survival, right? I think we have this image of these as being like, you know, teens that are wild and impulsive and, you know, want to cause shenanigans and get into trouble. And what I know from working with them is they are making the very best of generally a very bad set of circumstances. And it's very easy to sort of Monday morning quarterback some of these situations and go, well, these are all the things you could have done differently. But really what we need to be doing is working on creating a culture where kids don't have to make that choice in the first place. So that's a little bit of the landscape. We definitely still have third party control. We have pimps, have, you know, pimps um, exploiting young people and gangs and adult people and families. Um, but really what we need to be talking about is how do we interrupt this in the next generation, right? How do we prevent this? And I think there's a number of answers to that and you're gonna hear some great additional information on ways to do that. But what I really wanna offer is, um, I want to know how much, okay, how much time I have left, is how are we going to build more resilient youth, right? One of the things we know is that youth who are most likely um, uh, at risk for this is youth who have experienced previous harm, trauma or chaos in the home, who uh, are in the foster care child welfare system, who are experiencing poverty, and who are experiencing other forms of systematic discrimination. The disproportionality of this cannot be understated. Right? There's a study out of California that 85% plus of the victims are African American, but they only are 15% of the population. In the study done here in King County, about 55% of the data set found were African American, but that constitutes about 13% of the population here. They were 90% of the women they found on the streets of Minneapolis uh, in the Twin Cities were in First Nations or indigenous women, but they only constitute 5% of the population there. So one of the things that I want people to understand about how the commercial sex trade works is that it really is a part of our society. It's a fabric of our society that is where people are forced, where people land sometimes through various things that look like choice, but often it has mostly to do with survival. And so what we've learned about working with this population, the single most important lesson I've learned in a decade doing this is that relationship is the intervention. Right, the transformative relationships that counselors, mentors, we call them advocates mostly in this area, case managers, um, have with young people is the path through which they can, can find themselves out of this. Um, and I do say they find themselves because we don't rescue people, right? Rescues for kittens, we don't do it. Uh, we support people, we offer choices, we offer resources, we open doors, we accompany people. But one of the fundamental things that I think the trafficking movement, frankly, is getting wrong is the rescue mentality. And that's my own personal stuff. <laughs> but I've worked with a lot of young people and, and one of the things I know about them is they are so much more resilient <laughs> than most of the folks I, I know in my non-professional life. 
I think the other thing that we need to understand is that this is an economic strategy. And I know I've sort of alluded to that. But again, back to this, right? Most of us try to go out and, you know, get a job and it takes six weeks, at least if you work in my field. But youth, particularly youth who, you know, have more control over their setting or are getting a little older, understand that this gives them access to that unfettered, unregulated online marketplace. And what that becomes then is this sort of tap of money. And I know that that sounds, you know, harsh, but it is true. And that's really kind of how youth are experiencing it. Even in situations where they don't have control over their money, they experience that sort of what we call fast money because that's, that's how it works. There is an endless supply of buyers who will show up and provide cash under a whole variety of circumstances, right? There is an endless supply of demand. And so when we come in and we're meeting these youth and we're building relationships and we're offering them accesses and trying to open doors for them, one of the biggest things that we have to come up against is, but I see $500 a night, right? And where am I going to go get a job? You know, my mom can't even find a job and she's, you know, been a nurse for 20 years. So the economics of this is something that I really want people to take away and that if we really want to reduce this, if we want to interrupt this, the things that we're going to need to focus on are the following. Creating a culture of consent, first and foremost. Right? If you fundamentally do not objectify other people, if you ask for consent at every time, you are not going to grow up to be a buyer. You're just not. Right? At least not a buyer of someone you know, in, in a situation like this. Um, also focusing with young people on healthy relationships. You know, one of the, I think, um, also poorly understood part of our work with young people is that they really have to relearn relationship from the ground up, right? They've had a very, very adult set of experiences that, in circumstances that none of them deserved, and so they kind of have to go back to basics. Uh, and I think actually a lot of our kids do, right? I think they're getting some really mixed messages about what's expected from them um, as far as their cultural and, and gendered norms, as far as their sexual performance, as far as, you know, how they're supposed to really actually relate to one another. I think prevention efforts should focus, again, on building that culture of consent, but also things like teaching healthy communication, empathy, relationship skills, uh, and that attempts to go in and scare kids, which I think, you know, we've, we've seen some of, and this is a very scary issue, um, really are, they have enough out there to be scared of. Uh, so I really think that we should be focusing on building a lot of skill and resiliency. So what we do at Youth Care, we're the largest runaway homeless youth provider in um, in the Pacific Northwest. We have a continue we have a large continuum of services for youth 12 to 24 experiencing homelessness on the streets and a variety of, of um, situations. We do basic services. We do street outreach. We have the big green building down on Dale and yet uh, <laughs> Yale and Denny. Uh, we run four employment programs, um, uh, two educational programs, and then we have about eight housing programs, both for under 18 and over. 18. Within that larger continuum, we run the bridge continuum for sexually exploited youth. And this has worn many hats over the five years that I've been with youth care. Um, and what we have now is a really robust continuum that is built from that premise that relationship is the intervention. So advocates are available now in King County 24-7. Um, you can call 1-855-400-CSEC to make a referral if you need to in the literature's over there. Um, but those advocates really are, they're the gateway, right? They are, they are the support person. They are many, many things um, for our young people. And uh, we also have dedicated housing as well. So if you want more information on that, please let me know. And thanks so much for being here tonight. Thank you very much for having me. This is a real pleasure. Um, I've been in trial the last couple of weeks, and I want to thank Leslie for reminding us that it's Thursday because I've completely disconnected from space and time over the last couple of weeks. Um, but this is fun. It's exciting to talk about this uh, issue and, and to have a meaningful discussion. So uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about where we've been and mistakes we've made and where we're going. And um, this is what we're going to call the commercial sex ecosystem. And in the green is represents the supply. And that's um, what is commonly referred to as the prostituted person. The purple on the bottom is the distribution, which is referred to also as the, the pimp or the trafficker. And the red is the, um, is the, the demand, the supply, or the, excuse me, the buyer. And uh, the, these three uh, 
stool, uh, legs of the stool really represent sort of the three prongs of this ecosystem. And for a long time, our approach in the criminal justice system was to respond to the supply and to arrest women and children engaged in prostitution under the theory that the more we do it, that the, they're going to stop, right? And, and, and we'll get a grip on the problem. Uh, and what we found is when we started looking at some numbers is that um, in fact, we were, we were arresting them uh, at a rate of like three or four, as much as 10 times as often as we were arresting buyers. And you may have noticed that that strategy did not work. Um, in fact, it was an epic failure. And one of the things that was a failure about it is that we started talking to these uh, children or these women involved, and we started understanding that they were coming from all sorts of different backgrounds, but they were ending up in the same place, which was a, a position of being exploited. And uh, we found that they w entered in a variety of different ways, but again, uh, once they were out on the street, whether it was through survival or through an exploiter or through uh, whatever means, they were uh, not, they didn't have agency over, over that part of their life anymore. It was, you know, a choice of survival is not exactly a choice. And um, so uh, what we were finding is that most of them were vulnerable youth and, and that, um, it didn't make a lot of sense morally or, or from a justice perspective to be going after this group of people or um, really from the perspective of trying to uh, solve the problem. So we returned to this uh, ecosystem and uh, over the last few years the focus really shifted away from or, or is starting to shift away from arresting the prostituted person to the pimp or the trafficker, the person who's responsible for, for putting that, that individual out there. And we started doing that. We started doing it in an aggressive way, and the, the laws in our state really um, stepped up, and, and we were getting these tremendous sentences. And we started finding out what being a pimp was really all about. And this is a, um, this is a quote that I think sums up pimping better than any study that I can show you. Uh, if I had a female that listens 100%, we would, excuse me, I, I mean, I would be wealthy as, you know. And um, it's really, that's everything captured in one little quote right there about what this is about. It's about money, and it's not about being a democracy. It's about being a dictatorship. And it's about exploiting that person for the money that will make you wealthy. And all they have to do is listen. If they just listen, then I will be wealthy. Well, Shaq on Barbie, uh, did that with a lot of girls, uh, minors, and, and some adult women, and he, and he made a lot of money. Uh, these are $100, $100 bills, and those are diamond rings, and he bought Gucci clothes, and he did everything, and it was all because of these people working for him. And he liked to pose, and he liked to brag. Well, he was sentenced to 35 years in prison for that, um, which was great, except for the problem is, is that then somebody else steps into that place. And we, it's like a drug dealer. Uh, other drug dealers are not deterred by drug dealers going to prison. They're enabled, <laughs> right? And so um, we returned to this place and we're still sort of working through what, well, how, what's the way to get around this problem. And the area that for a long time was neglected was this demand uh, because that's who's driving the, the market. So uh, it's a very simple concept. If there aren't buyers, there aren't business. And those folks that, that Leslie was just talking about, the, them going in and, and wanting to make money or, or the pimps wanting to make money, they're not going to do it if there's not a, a, a marketplace to sell. It's also uh, a lot of violence is, is prevalent in uh, this particular area. Um, you, you know, this, there's a stats here that are staggering. I found one of the most staggering to be that 53 to 62 percent of of people in the life had been raped, and of, of the 60, half of those had been raped more than five times. I mean, that's, a, that's an astounding stat when you, when you ponder that for a moment. I mean, it's very hard to think of being raped once, but let alone that this has become sort of a norm. Uh, and that's certainly something that is concerning. A lot of that harm is not, is not um, inflicted by the pimps. It's inflicted by the buyers. Uh, Gary Ridgway, was a serial murderer, but his primary victim were prostituted youth and adults. Uh, he chose them because nobody cared. That was his, I mean, he was a buyer of the worst variety. What we found is that prevalence of, of violence in buying, and that this is not a one-off. This is something that they do often. Uh, some as many as multiple times a week. 
uh, we found men who w that we've caught who've bought over a thousand times. You know, and if you're talking a hundred or two hundred dollars each, that's a lot of money that's going into the commercial sex market, and that's a lot of incentive for people to engage in exploiting people to provide a supply for that demand. The other thing that's unusual is that while on the victim side we see heavily minority, heavily um, vulnerable youth, on the buyer side we see a completely different realm. Uh, al almost 90% white, uh, upper middle class, uh, educated, uh, pastors, teachers, lawyers, the whole shebang, business executives, all of those folks have come through um, my office uh, in cases involving them trying to buy sex from kids. We're not just talking about buying sex from adults. These are people who have been prosecuted for buying sex from kids. Uh, this is how prevalent it has become. We started doing some work on trying to understand uh, what the volume was, and we had some externs who uh, went on the, online, and <laughs> their job, kind of unpleasant, but their job was to basically go online and find any website where you could buy sex in our area, and they found over 130 uh, sites. This is not just uh, ads, <laughs> 130 websites. Each of those uh, sites can have a handful to several dozen to thousands of ads. Uh, we also started working with some researchers from Arizona State who looked at our county, one of the largest in the country, and started calculating and posting ads to understand what the level of, of demand was. Leslie mentioned this a few minutes ago about the, the response rates. Well, they'll put out ads, measure the responses, and then extrapolate it to the population. What we found is that in an area with about 774,000, about 3% of men are online uh, soliciting sex in a 24-hour period, so 27,000 men in King County. And that's a, a pretty staggering number when you start to think about the, the volume. We could have all the police in our area working on trying to respond to this problem and we wouldn't get a grip on it. So what do we do? Well, we came up with some ideas. <laughs> the first is uh, the thing that I mentioned a minute ago. Instead of arresting the girls and the women involved in this, instead of only focusing on the pimps, let's, let's start focusing on these men who are buying sex from kids and try to create an atmosphere of risk. So we started doing that, and it's going pretty well. Sadly, I mean, we get a lot of guys. I, I wish that there wasn't, it wasn't that easy, but in, in fact, it's incredibly easy to, to pick these folks off. Um, but the point is, is that we're creating an environment of risk, right? And an atmosphere where buying is now not okay. And even if we don't catch all of them, we're at least telling the community that it's important and that this is unacceptable. Then what do we do with them? Well, some of them get prison, some of them get jail, but all of them we're sending through an intervention program that one of our colleagues, Peter Qualiantine, has created. This is essentially a 10-week class on trying to work with these men to not buy sex in the future. Because we're only going to catch them once, right? They're going to get smarter, and so why don't we work with them and try to help them uh, not do this again. This may be surprising to you. It was very surprising to me when I learned it, but uh, in most men who buy sex are very ambivalent about it. Uh, almost none, like less than 1%, feel that it's a good thing. They do it, they feel horrible, then they do it again, they feel horrible, they do it again, they feel horrible. And so if we can connect with those men and work with them, we can help move them be out of that cycle, much like any addictive cycle, and try to move them in a more positive direction. The third thing that we're doing is community action. This is where some really exciting stuff is happening. One of them is in local governments. Uh, the state government has done some great things where uh, they passed some really wonderful laws to help us as prosecutors. But local governments can take action too, and one of the things we do, did was to create a proclamation talking about how lo that local government is committed to ending demand. This is really unique. Local governments haven't taken a stance on this before. And we've gotten a group of cities in King County to adopt this proclamation and to take a, a public stance on this issue. Our institutions taking a public stance on this is one of the first signs of our change in culture that Leslie talked about. That's really key in trying to change how people view this problem. 
we're also trying to get local governments to actually focus on um, going after the demand in their area, and we've had some really great response. Eight cities are now part of our partnership in, in their police activities. We've gone, uh, done some social media work as well. Seattle Against Slavery, who was mentioned earlier, has done some really great stuff contacting men between the ages of 18 and 24 and talking with them about this problem. Why that age? Because age 21 is the age when most men start buying sex. And so we have to connect with those men early, not when they're 50 and they've been doing it for 30 years. <clears throat> Another example of the kinds of things that we're working on is to put together a survivor art show, and the Organization for Prostitution Survivors has been working on this. Why does this matter? It's because it gives an outlet for survivors to talk about their experience, and then the art show is going to go into public forums, city halls around our community. That, again, is an opportunity for that message to get out in a really positive way into the community where this is happening, so that people who are coming into those public forums can see this is something our community is aware of and is committed to, to resolving. Business engagement. Um, because most buyers are upper, middle to upper class men, uh, those guys work at businesses. And if business culture is contributing to uh, buying sex, to you know, going abroad and going to strip clubs and to purchasing sex out on the street or whatever, uh, that's furthering and enabling that practice. So we've started a project with businesses ending slavery and trafficking to start connecting with businesses in our community to have them take an anti-sex buying policy uh, and approach in their business. What does that mean? Well, for example, if you get caught buying sex, you might be prosecuted. But what if your business also said, if you get caught buying sex, you're going to be suspended without pay for a month or fired? What, the idea there is that we don't want people to lose their job. We want them to know that and to not buy sex. That's the key. The idea is to prevent this from happening in the first place rather than respond to it afterwards. I always tell people, my job as a prosecutor is, is really discouraging sometimes because something bad has to happen before I get involved. <laughs> and I would much rather that we could get out in front of this problem rather than reacting to it. Online deterrence is another thing. We're starting to work with um, companies in our area to uh, put up ads, much like this lawnmower ad, but ads when men are searching for sex online to buy it, we can put up ads that say, hey, don't do this. Did you know that if you get caught buying sex, you can be punished in the following way? Uh, those are really effective ways to get men at the time when they are look, looking to buy sex in the marketplace where they're looking to buy it. And that can be a really effective way to try to deter them from doing that. Finally, public education. This, this moment right now that we're having. This is an, uh, uh, an incredibly important part of changing the culture around this. What we found in our social media campaign is that um, men were much less likely to pull up the information about this issue uh, than women were in social media, and the women were much more likely to refer it to the men. I'm looking out here right now and I see mostly women. <laughs> you know, I, I, this is a, a male-dominated problem, but to me this is great because I know all you guys are gonna go back to your men and tell them about it, right? <laughs> you are the messengers, and you are the most effective people at trying to start talking to men, because if I just go in a room full of men, it won't have the same impact as when you talk to them about it. We wanna create that atmosphere of risk, but we also wanna change the norm so that we can pre prevent this problem from happening in the first place. Thank you very much. And now we have um, Rose Gunderson. I've got to put on my glasses here. Uh, she uh, has an executive juris doctorate. I hope I'm saying that right. She held a two-year human trafficking policy externship at the Washington State Attorney General's office while at law school. She co-founded Washington Engage, uh, which seeks to eradicate sex and labor trafficking in Washington State. The Coalitions Against Trafficking, C-A-T, uh, initiative is Rose's vision to go on beyond awareness to prevent human trafficking through applying a collective impact among a network of leaders in a peer-to-peer -peer learning environment. Rose. 
It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure speaking to the League of Women Voters, because you are about policy. You're about educating people on, on voting and voting with, with um, knowledge. And what we're about Washington Gage, the way we started, is because I was doing policy research, and I believe policy is a way to create long-term systemic change or systematic change. And so we have this in common with you, and so I'm glad that I am part of tonight's panel. Um, we want to see long-term change. That's who we are. But before we go on, I want to let you know that I'm, I'm just like you. I have my skill set, I have my gift set, and I want to collect all of us together in order to create this change, because me by myself cannot create a change. And just so I want to show you, I'm a human being. I have a family, three kids, one of my daughter, what, my daughter is here, and um, my kids are really unique. They come from big families, 15 um, cousins on my side of the family and 15 cousins on my husband's side of the family. Three of them are adopted from Liberia. So they have cousins all over the world. It's so fun. Um, it, it's, an, it's an incredible family environment. And um, so that's, that's me. I'm a common person. And you, you have a story. You have a common thing. But I believe you could be part of the change as well. Um, just want to tell you how we got started. It was just a vision um, I had when I was still in law school. Got connected with um, another woman, Dina Burke, who lives really close to here. And we decided we're going to we're going to tell the legislator, hold them accountable, to say if you're going to say you want you will fight against human trafficking, make a proclamation, then do something about it. So the, so we asked them. We uh, um, coordinated an advocacy day called Anti Trafficking Engagement Day. We didn't know what policies were going to be coming or whatsoever. We just organized that day. 150 people show up, mostly from Seattle. We were, we were just floored. If one of the pictures shows you we're trying to give them packets to go to legislators. We ran out of packets. Um, Safe Harbor Law was passed that year, where we um, the first offense of a minor being charged for prostitution would be decriminalized. Um, second year, 2011, I, I was looking at this, this law that our, our state prohibits um, two-party consent voice recording um, because of the emphasis here. And, but it, it was available to truck, drug trafficking investigation so that police can use it to protect themselves and also use it for court evidence. And it really is re highly recommended by many policy organizations. So I was going to propose it. People told me, don't try it. Good luck. And, and I said, well, I don't have a job. I have nothing to lose. I'm going to do it. And we got passed in one session. Um, so j j you know, if you have nothing to lose, just, just go do it. That's <laughs> so the, in, in 2012, I wrote this packet um, with major concepts, and, and we also held a big conference pre-event, pre-legislative session. Um, you know, I have people come in and put, look at my whole packet of paper and, and give input, and I gave that packet to uh, one of the senators, Senator Frazier, and she just took it to the co-revisor's office and wrote about 12 bills out of that. And that year, all of it, Pretty much, all, most of them were passed, and and um, so it it was a lot of fun. We had edu we educate um, advocates to co go talk to legislators. We organize them. We you know told them when to call, make phone calls, and stuff like that. Um, so I was able to um, um, be part of the change that really could not be possible if I just wrote a paper. We organized people to come support it. We we got legislators to took the paper and do that. So um, because of that, in 2012 and 2013, our state was recognized as having the best law of um, 50 states when it comes to human trafficking. Um, so here's the good news. We're one of the best states when it comes to human trafficking laws. And nobody is for modern day slavery. The bad news is that the laws are not uniformly enforced. And it's, you know, it's great to have King County support to, you know, Val is just so passionate about it with, with um, the support from different cities, but around the state, I go walk, talk to people over and over again. Law enforcement keep telling me, "Oh, that's available. That's that's there," and they have no idea. Um, as close as some other King County jurisdictions, I still find the same problem. So these are the implicit oppositions. They don't know the law, but really, there are a lot of social norms that says, you know, boys are going to be boys. And then we'll also talk about, um, I'll, I'll tell you, the, the, the notion of empowerment is being twisted. And, and Leslie alluded to some of the 
the examples, and, and we'll talk a little bit more. And we have upcoming events that talk about why the notion of empowerment has been twisted so much that that's why our youth is so easily allured into it. So the sis there's, there are no systems to distribute the state laws. And there, are no, and there are systematic problem is that when there's no funding, they say, I'm not going to do one more thing. Not that it's, it's just, it's just a, you know, they have law enforcement, they are overwhelmed. You know, I know Val works overtime all the time. They're overwhelmed. So to tell them to do one more thing, they, they you know, somebody has to go, t to go ask them and, and, and really and petition or advocate for it. So these are the resistance. And in general, there are four ways to combat human trafficking. One is prevention, prosecution, which is what Val does, protection, which is what um, Leslie does. And the f last one is partnership. So the way Washington Engage, fo what we focus on is to leverage resources of different people, different sectors, to work together to prevent human trafficking. One big component of prevention is that when we can successfully advocate for policy and sy systems change, that's how we can create long-term change, and that's what we're trying to do. Um, so how do we do it? You know, when I, I, I recently wrote this little booklet on Roadmap to Successful Advocacy, we do advocacy training and hope that you can join us sometime. Um, if I boil it down to it, there are three ingredients. One is quality. When we have good policy concepts that are research-based, informed by survivors, and really in, in to integrate different knowledge of uh, business laws and labor laws and all that together, we can really eliminate and reduce some of the exploitations. The other one is quantity. Again, just because I wrote a paper doesn't mean that it's going to be passed into law. I need to organize people to come support it and also come to make sure that it's going to be enforced. So I need quantity. The third ingredient is authenticity. We need survivors who are going to speak up and tell lawmakers and tell people what their stories really are. And so these are the three m important ingredients to successful advocacy. As I said, in 2012, I wrote this paper. It was a lot of the concepts were passed into law. Just this last year, I, I published another paper called Beyond Sex Trafficking, Combating Commercial Sexual Exploitation. Um, besides um, the prostitution kind that the kind of prostitution that Leslie and, and um, Val talk about. There's legal and unregulated, regulated and, and unregulated commercial sexual exploitations in strip clubs, porn making industry, bikini barista stands, illicit massage, and um, escort services. We all know what that is. Um, how do we reduce the harm that really happens under legally legal businesses? So that's what we're about. And so the quantity-wise, we have formed eight coalitions from Whatcom to Thurston County. And um, we've been trying to really improve our mo model and doing what we can to um, really, in each area, we have people from different, a broad spectrum of um, social view all work together to say, we're going to stand up on this, on this women, mostly women issues and when it comes to sex trafficking. And we're going to. Um, support one another. Um, I'm from Thurston County. My um, leader is a board member of now, now National Organization for Women. And, and we have faith-based people all working together as well. It's a wonderful mix to say we're going to end slavery and um, promote gender equality. Um, we focus on four strategies, promote policies, reduce root causes, educate the public, and protect youth. Um, that's the quantity side. And though, so we're, we're going to try to add the survivor advocacy to really help them know how to advocate effectively so that people will not say it's your fault. That's what we're trying to do. Um, measurable advocacy direction. So um, in the policy paper that I just finished last year, we have three policy themes that we want to focus on. Um, the first one is, it, it didn't come from me, it really came from um, the legislative paper and also from the uh, interviews that I've been doing around the state, knowing that the wonderful laws that we have passed, enacted, are not being enforced. And what we need to do is to promote the use of existing laws. Um, practically, we don't really need to pass more laws. We just need to use them. Um, sexual businesses, I talked about, their exploitation is very severe in those businesses as well, from the research and interviews that I've, I've been doing. And what we need to do is to try to find ways to reduce the harm that happens under legal businesses. And how can, how can we advocate for that as well? 
Um, the other ones that address one of the root causes is the sexualization of youth and culture. Um, Leslie had talked about how, you know, their notion of empowerment or what they think, you know, they can just do it and, you know, and better access to, to wealth and, and do whatever they want and the sexualized culture just really give them a different idea of what we believe healthy sex or extra sexuality should be. Um, so we need to do prevention with a, a very um, um, broad public health approach. We need to stimulate the anti-smoking anti, um, movement. Um, so the progress that um, we've done so far is in terms of training, when the legislative session started, I, I wasn't really looking at everything. When Then I started looking at bills, I go, oh no, the central party that was in the legislative report, nobody proposed a bill. So two weeks into the session, I just worked really hard uh, with my um, survivor advocate. We knocked on a lot of doors and got a bill proposed today. It was voted on the floor in the Senate. So I believe it passed. Now we have to go to the House to get that passed. The second one is use um, licensing requirements, zoning laws, legal codes to regulate or close down some of the sexual businesses. From what I look at, you know, we know sexual exploitation, uh, sexual assault, and, and illegal activities happen in all these, you know, strip clubs and bikini barista stands. And, um, and really, these businesses um, break labor laws. A lot of them are considered, con so, um, most of them are considered independent contractors, when according to IRS rules, they violate every one of it. And nobody is doing anything about it. Um, and also in Bikini Barista stands, if you look at the health inspection um, results, most of them in King County and, and, and Pierce County repeatedly fail the food inspection result. Is anybody doing anything about it? By the way, People who serve drinks and coffee, don't they, shouldn't they wear clothes to cover up hair and all these body things? <laughs> it's easy to regulate and eliminate that kind of operations um, if we inform the people in the county or, it's, or state level. But I just finished the paper. I just haven't had time. You know, we, I, there's a lot of education to do in order to push those things to move forward. So there are a lot of different ways to eliminate or reduce the harm that's happening to people who are in these type of businesses. Um, and I worked a lot in Pierce County last year and the last test, <laughs> the last session, the attorney from strip clubs came and threatened lawsuits. It's, it was pretty ugly. I wish I could show you the DVD. Um, address the sexualized culture. So what we're doing is in this month, next two weeks, we are hosting four different forums in Tacoma, Kent, uh, Bellevue, and, and Olympia called the Cultural Grooming, how our kids and culture and how the sexualized culture really um, promote. And there's a high correlation to the rise of sex trafficking because of the sexualized culture, and it's based on research as well. Um, there will be a drama commissioned by um, Washington Gage, and um, that you'll get to watch a drama. It, it tells the story in a very impactful, lively way. So I, I'm just really excited about it. So promote the use of existing laws, reduce harm in commercial sexual exploitation businesses is the second theme. And I talk about um, the porn making strip clubs and you know strong lobbying, speech, a free speech coalition. It's not free speech. They're all um, as a lobbying group all. Um, it's funded by sexual businesses and porn making industry. And unregulated businesses, they, they, they have a shingle that says it's not sexual, sexual, it's a massage business, it's barista, but we all know what that means. We all know what escort services are. There's not much <laughs> that are being done by it um, to, to reduce the harm and exploitations that's there, but if we really use business laws and different labor laws, we can, re we can do a lot more to protect them. In fact, a recent case in Nevada um, against the Gentlemen's Club have, de have made a ruling that um, dancers need to be paid at least minimum wage. They need to be, they cannot be um, independent contractors. So that's something we can use as a president to go to our state and ask for that regulation. Um, so I'm not going to go into that a lot more. Um, 
there are a lot of different um, policy recommendations and changes that could be made at the county and city level. I just need a lot of people to go there instead of just my voice. How do we address root cause of the, one of the root causes is the sexualized culture. And um, as Leslie said, um, our youth don't really care about their image being sex, text, text, texted to a, to a boyfriend or, or go on the internet. They just think it's no big deal. Why? Because the notion of empowerment has been twisted so bad that they, they don't believe it, they're being exploited. Um, so when a social issue is affecting individuals or groups in ways beyond their capacity to correct, a public health approach is warranted so that we as a society can collectively assure the conditions in which people can be healthy. Mm -hmm. This is by a consultant to the DC, um, CDC, um, sex education, uh, sexual uh, sex educator. She wrote a book called The Impact of Porn on Children, Youth, and Culture, and that book will be available to, for sale at cost at our event that's um, next Monday in Kent, and then on the 19th in Bellevue. There will be a lot of information, like even a, a poster on what the definition of healthy sexuality is and what it's not. We'll make it available. We want to, we want to see the whole sex ed be revamped in our school. It's so outdated. Um, that, so the, there are a lot of things, things that need to change, and we need an army to, to, to promote that change. And this is the information. There will be flyers. There are maybe flyers that you've received already. Um, you, you know, you're familiar with policy advocacy. You can be part of the change so that, so that this will not happen in your city. And that's it. That's my contact information. Um, thank you so much. And now we have a, a speaker who will speak for five minutes and will be introduced by Leslie Briner. Thank you. Thanks. I just want to do a quick introduction of Nicholas Oakley. He is with the Center for Children and Youth Justice, a longtime friend and colleague who is the first Terry Kimball Fellow at the Center for Children and Youth Justice, carrying on the great work of Terry Kimball in the development and implementation of the statewide model protocol, which he's going to share a little bit more about. Welcome, Nicholas. Well, thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me and um, adding me on last minute. Unlike our uh, esteemed panel, I'm not an expert. It's just my job to coordinate experts. And so I'd like to talk to you uh, for a few minutes about what's happening uh, statewide in Washington. Um, the Center for Children and Youth Justice was founded by Justice Bobby Bridge of the Washington State Supreme Court, who's also a league member. She's sorry she can't be here tonight. Um, we work to reform the juvenile justice or juvenile criminal justice system and foster care or child welfare systems. Um, in 2011, we were awarded a federal grant to develop a model protocol for responding to commercial sexual exploitation of children. And it was specifically a victim-centered response. Um, and we're actually in partnership with Youth Care on that grant um, with Leslie. Uh, we raised over $100,000 to match that grant, and we spent um, the better part of 2012 um, on a road trip across the state interviewing experts like these, um, on the ground folks, survivors, and we really focused on two questions. One, what does victim-centered mean? And two, what is your ideal response? Um, and I can tell you, and I, I don't think it's surprising that the, you know, there were differing opinions on the specifics, um, but really there was a strong consensus that one, uh, the response should be coordinated, um, Two, that we should try to minimize, if not totally eliminate, the use of detention in the juvenile justice system for these young women, mostly young women. Um, and three, that we really need to focus on the needs of the youth. Um, it's not rocket science, um, but it's what we needed to do. And so based on this feedback and with endorsement of our statewide leaders, we developed this protocol and it really lays out a structure for providing a victim-centered approach uh, to commercially sexually exploited children or sex trafficked youth um, that can really be modified to meet the unique needs of, of the communities in which it's implemented. And this structure is as follows. It's on the ground level, there's multidisciplinary teams, um, and these are comprised of representatives from law enforcement, um, the courts, social service providers. And so really, it, it's so that that advocate, that person that the youth has a relationship with, is at the table with everybody else who has sort of an impact on that youth's life, and that's really, really important. And then at the next level, we have task forces. And these are uh, intended to focus on improving collaboration, reducing barriers, and getting resources. And so you have 
representatives, leaders from all those agencies that participate in the multidisciplinary teams meeting at a higher level and saying, okay, what do we need to do to make this happen, to make this work? And then finally, at the top level, we have the statewide coordinating committee. And uh, the task forces report to this committee, and then the committee in turn reports to the state legislature and advocates for policy change. And this is also a place where we all can come to the table and folks with less resources can learn from folks in King County who have more resources and what they're doing and try to implement it in their own communities. Um, so upon completion of the model protocol, um, it was implemented in five pilot sites. This was King, Spokane, Whatcom, Yakima, as well as the Tri-Cities region. Um, and recently, Clark County joined that. So I'm happy to report that 56% of Washingtonians live in a region that is participating in this coordinated response. And so if the work of the task forces and the implementation of the model protocol is what's being done, data collection is what needs to be done. And so we're also focusing on this. And so in 2013, we ran a pilot data collection study um, based on a tool created by Dr. Deborah Boyer, and she was the author of the Who Pays the Price? It was a 2008 assessment of juvenile uh, youth involvement in prostitution in Seattle. And so beginning this spring, um, we plan on using that tool to conduct a minimum of an ongoing two-year study. Um, and with this tool, we'll be able to collect, one, the number of sexually trafficked youth served by any participating agency, the means of exploitation, so this includes uh, you know, use of the internet, um, gang involvement, uh, erotic dancing, pornography, and so on, and then also some basic characteristics like age, sex, sexual orientation, race, um, and education and living situation. And so, um, of course, this tool will only be effective, right, if those uh, using it are trained in identification, and so we have Leslie to thank for that, and is really helping doing that, and also, um, if agencies can vote, devote the time without additional funding at this point uh, to complete the tool on a consistent, regular, um, and ongoing basis. But it is our view that this data will be absolutely essential uh, to obtaining the much needed resources we need um, and to continue a successful, coordinated, statewide, and victim-centered response. Thank you so much. Uh, could you give us some ideas of what the ordinary, caring individual can do to help? I mean, there are a lot of us right here, right now. What's something we can do this coming week? Um, go on our website and look at, um, or, or go to our Facebook, Washington Engage Facebook. We put our information on the bills and what you can do. Sign up for a newsletter, and you can easily do something in the next couple of months when it comes to all the bills that are going to be voted on. I guess the, the only thing I'd add to that is um, talk to your friends and family about this issue. Spread the, spread the word about what it involves and um, who it involves um, and talk to people about healthy relationships instead of um, negative ones. <laughs> and I would just add that, you know, there's, um, there's a lot of organizations doing a lot of work on this topic. I, I went from the time where this used to be the loneliest little soapbox to a room of 100 caring, concerned citizens and, you know, hundreds and hundreds of organizations. They all do something a little different. There's Seattle Against Slavery. There's the, you know, organizations represented here. There's businesses ending slavery and trafficking. There's a whole host of faith-based organizations. They need people. They need in-kind donations. They need lots and lots of stuff. And, and part of what this builds is an infra infrastructure for the, for the services, for the recovery, for the policy needs. Um, so I know we always say, well, you can donate and volunteer. But there are a lot of really great volunteer opportunities and ways to support the organizations on the ground. There are something like 27,000 buyers right here in the Seattle area, and I find myself wondering about the Seattle port and the, the area uh, down to as far as Olympia and whatever. Um, is there something, what makes this a place that seems to be so attractive to uh, this awful stuff that's going on, the tra human trafficking? Well, I'm happy to say actually that it, it, we are one of the lower uh, areas percentage-wise compared oh, wow. to some other areas. Some uh, cities, according to some recent studies, were as high as 15 or even 20 percent of the male population was participating in buying sex online. Uh, we're at somewhere closer to three, three and a half percent. So that, um, 
I, I mean, it's, it's sort of a race to the bottom when you start talking about those numbers, and it's not exactly encouraging. That being said, um, I think we are a very popular uh, area for trafficking because we're on what's called a circuit, uh, and that circuit extends from Seattle or even Vancouver down the west coast to through Portland, Oakland, uh, San Diego, over to Phoenix, back up to Las Vegas, and, and then back up again. And, and girls, um, particularly girls, sometimes young women are brought around that circuit because it helps isolate them. And it facilitates the exploitation process if you can take them out of their home and take them on the road where they don't have connections to friends and family. Uh -huh. And so that is one of the reasons that we are a um, popular place for that. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, this is one from the audience. With only a percent of trafficking victims being sex trafficked, how can we support and justify end demand tactics as a solution to the underlying issues of abuse and exploitation? Sex workers see this as ineffective and ridiculous as end demand for clothing, agricultural goods, or domestic services. Ideas that no one could support. Does this mean anything? Would anybody like to comment? Uh, I think there's a lot of things going on in that question. Uh, I think this is a very... Uh, real debate that is, is an old debate actually. Um, but I think what we focus, what we're focused here on tonight is people who are uh, under forced fraud or coercion or under the age of 18 caused to engage in a commercial sex act, which is in fact the federal and state definition of human trafficking. Um, I think the, what I, my personal response to that is that uh, demand does drive a market, right? From a purely economic standpoint, regardless of how you might feel about the policies or tactics, there's a fundamental reality that without buyers, there would not be business of this. And, you know, there's part of the problem of not having good data is that we don't have good data. But I've spent 10 years of my life, I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of young people who were out there under force, fraud, and coercion, who were treated badly, and I believe that the people who buy them and sell them and profit off them should um, be held responsible and accountable under the laws of the state of Washington. Thank you. Thank you. Um, how about the Netherlands, where prostitution is legal? Does legality stop exploitation? No. <laughs> uh, there have been a number of countries that have experimented with legalization, and the research that's been done involving those countries has almost universally concluded that uh, legalization, instead of uh, helping the problem of exploitation, uh, tends to exacerbate it. And it's a very simple concept. If you say it's okay to buy sex, the demand will increase because people will be uh, enabled in doing that. And when that demand increases, the supply does not increase to meet it. Uh, people generally do not want to be engaging in this, uh, in selling sex. And so what happens at that point is that um, the pressure of meeting that demand just increases. I can't read this. And so child prostitution, forced sex trafficking, all of these things actually increase in areas where legalization has occurred, and that's exactly what's happened in the Netherlands. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question here. Um, is the, uh, the sex trafficking increased by out-of-town visitors? Yes. <laughs> uh, we looked at buyers um, that we had caught in King County, and uh, over half, about 53%, were from out of King County. Uh, about 20% or so were from out of state. Mm -hmm. And so business travelers definitely contribute to the market in a significant way. I would also say that um, Seattle being sort of the hub of the region, it has uh, created a draw from other areas, which is really problematic. Boy, I guess. Okay. Um, what can one do to stop the enabler, such as hotels that give rooms to buyers with their victims? Can one shut down websites is another question. I mean, all in one person here. Uh, well, I'll, 
I'll talk about website. Um, okay. You know, we've know, all known about the Backpage.com as being the one of the websites that's. I, I've known high school girls who went on there and found their classmates on that website. Um, I will, because of the First Amendment right and also um, freedom of the press and most importantly, um, this Communications Decency Act that our Congress has passed has given a, an immunity clause um, against liability of website um, hosts who, um, they like, like Craigslist, for third party content, the website host cannot be held liable for the content. Therefore, Backpage is not liable for what the pimp and these, you know, self, these third party content. Um, our state has actually, in 2012, to try to pass a law. We did pass this law saying that um, you could be criminally liable for website hosts unless the only defense is is saying that if you verify the age of the person who's posting the ad, then you have a defense. So basically, we're asking website to verify age. Mm -hmm. But what Backpage took us to, to, to court, and they won. Um, the reason our state did not appeal on for that in that case is because of the Communications Decency Act. There's, you can write language to overcome other constitutional issues, but when there's a, you know, a federal law that trumps state law, we cannot overcome it unless the unless, unless Congress changed the law. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we cannot shut down a website. We can mm -hmm. at this time it's um, mm -hmm. it's pretty hopeless. Mm -hmm. um, Backpage is being taken to court, and the case was heard at the state supreme court um, back in October on one issue that was able to move it to the state supreme court. Um, we are still waiting on the decision. I hope, I hope the state Supreme Court will allow further discovery as to exactly what Backpage does to further the manipulation of, you know, drawing these third party content to make money. I hope they will allow further discovery, mm -hmm. but we don't know yet. Okay. Thank you. Um, beyond sex trafficking, could you speak to labor trafficking, including imported labor to work in, uh, I can't read this. <laughs> but the rest of it will just there are sweatshops. I can read that part. But how about imp, uh, traffic, uh, trafficking people from outside the country here? Well, I'm a mail order bride. No, <laughs> I'm from. I grew up in a different country. I sometimes joke about that. Labor trafficking is a very difficult um, case to discover. In fact, many of the real labor trafficking cases have ended up um, prosecuting under labor exploitation laws, mm -hmm. um, wage um, laws, you know, that something different because it is so difficult to prove the force for the coercion when a person had initially came voluntarily and have received some pay, not the adequate, not adequate pay, but some. And therefore, and also to to us, you know, we could see people working in the hotel and domestic servants. We it's really difficult for plain plain eyes to see. Mm -hmm. um, the federal there's a DOJ task force here who does a, quite a few try to really help victims of labor trafficking when they come and and ask for help. There there are there's help for them, but when it comes to conviction, um, many cases that try to do the labor trafficking cases have, have to be dropped because they don't have sufficient evidence to, over, to arrive at the criminal conviction. But it's likely that there are more labor trafficking victims than sex trafficking victims. Yeah, globally, that certainly I think is true. Um, I would just add that there there is a, a detective that works within Seattle Police Department under a special grant who purely does um, international and focuses on labor trafficking cases. So we do have some dedicated law enforcement. Um, they're also part of WASH Act, which is the Washington Anti-Trafficking Committee, which is one of the oldest task forces on this issue in the state. Um, they partner with agencies like API Chaya um, uh, to provide those culturally um, uh, 
specific services, language interpretation services. So the, the network of responses and services for international foreign-born individuals and labor trafficking victims uh, is really pretty robust in our state. The issue of identification, of course, is the most difficult, but we really are actually considered a leader in the country on this, on this issue. Okay, thank you. Um, here's uh, someone asking if buyers were given a sex offender quote unquote label and had to register as such once conv convicted, do you think that might help decrease th the demand? Uh, currently, men who, or anybody who tries to or actually successfully buys sex from a child is, uh, does receive sex offender registration. Uh, it's not a registrable offense to buy sex from an adult. Um, I have not seen that be a large deterrent, uh, but one of the issues is that a lot of men aren't aware of the severity of the punishments, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we've tried to take some steps to um, disseminate that information in an effort to explain to them this is really serious. Mm -hmm. And if we can get them to understand that, uh, we might be able to encourage them not to do it. Um, in studies, men have reported sex offender registration to be something they would be worried about. Uh, I think maybe a slightly more productive approach would be to try to work with men to not buy sex in the first place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There, there are a couple of questions here that somehow boil down to my mind, um, asking why is there a demand? Another person says something very similar. Of, if you don't happen to have a wife or a girlfriend, what do we do? This is from the <laughs> buyer's point of view. <laughs> yeah, I, I, don't, sort of I don't think I'm going to answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I have a, a long question. This is uh, a good to you, male. Val. <laughs> Treat women well. Okay, there you go. <laughs> uh, so this is for Val. Uh, the, uh, this one person um, writes, the, the clients of sex workers um, are not the problem. They want, to be, they want to be the solution. They are the ones who will meet victims of sex trafficking. Let's allow them to report suspected victims. I have been a sex worker for over 10 years. My clients are your brothers, your fathers, your sons, your uncles, and your husbands, and they are kind, generous, good men. Putting these men in jail won't save any exploited persons. Buyers Beware is not trying to help exploited persons. It is an attempt to abolish prostitution. Prostitution isn't going away, but the buyer's beware will make it more dangerous, both for the consensual sex workers and for sexually exploited persons. So that's, that's certainly a perspective. Um, and here's the deal, I've been a service provider my entire career, and that's a long time. I'm never gonna sit across from an individual human being and say you're not an expert in your own experience, because one of the first rules of what I do is everybody gets to be an expert in their own experience. But here's the deal, you gotta have a framework. And the framework, at least, that I adhere to and I would imagine that my colleagues do is that prostitution is a form of violence against women, children, trans folks, and sometimes other men. And it sits on that violence continuum with domestic violence, sexual assault, sexual harassment, and a whole host of other gender-based violence. So while there are people, certainly in the trade, individual folks who have an experience that works for them, and I'm happy that they have an experience that works for them. The vast majority of folks in the commercial sex trade went in prostitution, when asked, would prefer to do something else. And that's for adults, right? I've worked with kids, and that's a whole different sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So these are old issues, these are complex issues, but the perspective of an, a, a small minority of people who, again, uh, um, if you're having a good time, then that's great, and if your life's working for you, that's great, should not trump, from a policy perspective, from the standpoint of setting social norms, the fact that this is a system of violence against women, children, trans folks, and sometimes other men. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question asking about first responders. Is there uh, evidence that you've seen that firemen, um, for example, of police, first responder types, can be helpful in some way? In other words, let's say there's a fire, I guess. Yes. 
Uh, definitely. Uh, whoever is the first contact with an exploited person, it's really important that they're trained and that they're aware mm -hmm. uh, and that they're watching for the signs. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how um, people can, can be um, brought to services or given an opportunity to receive help if they want it. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've been working on several projects in King County to uh, try to train uh, a number of first responders or people that you might not think about being first responders. For example, uh, inspectors uh, going into restaurants, you know, be watching out for labor trafficking or mm -hmm. um, hotel licensors going into hotels. Mm -hmm. A lot of different um, opportunities there to just bring awareness to um, government employees who might be out in the public and might interact with this. And it, I think there's a great opportunity there to try to help. Thank you. Um, in spite of all the new buildings and apartments to uh, house the homeless, the numbers of people living on the street seems to increase. Is there any housing especially for victims of trafficking? Uh, well, yes, there are. Uh, and, and I think that the larger frame of, of homelessness is really an important one to understand, right? Because there's lots of things that drive people into this in the first place. So Youth Care runs the bridge continuum of services for sexually exploited youth, which includes the advocates in the community-based end. It also includes dedicated beds in our under-18 emergency shelter and our under-18 long-term transitional living program at Pathways. So while for a long time I think the movement thought the idea of like, you need these safe houses you need these standalone programs where you can put all the kids under one roof. Having run two of the first five of those in this country, I can tell you that it's really not that easy and it doesn't actually work that way. Um, you know, my, one of my favorite quotes from a young person is, we each need something different to get out, but we all need people with hearts. And so we really need to start there with that relationship. Um, REST, which is Real Escape from the Sex Trade, a faith-based organization, runs um, a program here for 18 to 24-year-olds that's long-term transitional housing. Uh, and there's several other projects around the west side of the, the state that, that have emerged. There's one up in Bellingham. Um, but really, Youth Care has the only beds that are for under 18-year-olds. So housing is, housing is just a broad issue. And um, the, it really, uh, the economy has, has you know, driven a lot of this. You know, the number of kids we have down at Orion who are 16 years old who say my parents kicked me out because they can't afford me anymore. It is just a story that we hear commonly down at the Orion Center. Um, so we have a lot of work that we need to be doing around just affordability, accessibility in this city, um, and of course increased housing services for all people experiencing homelessness. Thank you. I have a question here saying, is punishment different or more extreme for repeat offenders of sex trafficking? Yes, it is. Uh, the way our scoring system works uh, in Washington State is that if you have prior convictions, they will count against subsequent uh, convictions. And uh, that escalates very quickly when you're talking about uh, the crimes of human trafficking or promoting commercial sexual abuse of a minor. Thank you. Th that's how you know, pimps like Shaqon Barbie, who I mentioned earlier, are now spending longer in prison than people who have even killed another person. Uh -huh. uh, that the crimes are, have very serious punishments. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, this just in: uh, Would more societal support for labor rights, for collective bargaining rights in hotels, restaurants, Microsoft contractors, etc., workers, help on this issue? Well, labor rights. Uh, do you want to address it? Or, uh, okay. Well, I, I would say that, I mean, that's a complicated question. If you're talking about labor trafficking, I think that uh, there's a lot of opportunity for regulations to protect people from being exploited. Uh, on the issue of sex trafficking, um, we have talked with businesses about incorporating into bargaining agreements um, uh, clauses relating to codes of conduct relating to buying sex. Uh, and there's, a, I think, another opportunity there to help shape uh, individual behavior. When it comes to foreign nationals who are being labor trafficked, most of them are recruited by re labor recruiters. They're not part of any union or whatsoever. So the laws that need to be, we need to focus on how we regulate labor recruiters. And, um, and that's the angle we should use instead of, uh, because foreign nationals don't usually get to become part of a union. They are 
contractors that they're not part of the employees, a lot of them. So that's. Say quickly, the other the other policy move that is gaining traction is is really just looking at supply chains, um, and so California had, had passed the first state level so, um, clean supply chain act that's being used as a model at other states, um, but a lot of this labor trafficking happens at different points along the way at the source of the goods that we buy, um, so that's something socially responsible buying uh, and understanding where our goods and services and products are coming from is something that can interrupt this as well. I've just discovered another answer to that very first question about how can we help, mm -hmm. and it is that we, um, Allison is about to put some cards that look like this on the youth care uh, table over here, and this is what it says on the front of the card. Youth care asks that you keep this card with you should you encounter a young person who needs our help, and then on the back it, it gives ideas of the kind of help that that person might need. Do you need help finding a place to sleep, food, shower, clothing, that kind of thing? Can we do one more question? Okay. Um, somebody here is asking, uh, how do we eliminate the rescue mentality? Ooh, can I have that? Oh, you go. Go, go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, know, you know, it's an interesting thing. When I started doing this, um, None of this was a felony, right, anywhere in the country, right? I, I would go to San Francisco County, where I'm from originally, and sit across the table from these 13-year-old kids and who were in on their third prostitution charge, and nobody was paying attention. And so I think part of what happened is as we, there was a groundswell, and as we built a movement, and as we started talking about this, because of how horrific this, this is for the people who are experiencing it, it really lends to this victim mentality, right? And I know that we talk about victim-centered services, but more like these people are broken, they're brainwashed, they're, you know, they're little broken flowers that we have to go in and save. And, and that's why I always try to make it a point to say these are some of the most resilient young people you are ever going to meet. They are smart, they are sharp, they are resilient, and they've had a really, really tough life. So I think one of the things that I the way I like to reframe this is instead of trying to uh, go save the victims, we need to think about how, we, how we're going to save ourselves, <laughs> right? Each individually in our families and our communities. Um, because it's real easy to go out there and say like, oh, you're broken and I'm going to fix you. It's much harder to look internally and say, how am I contributing to unfair labor? How am I contributing to a culture of, of hypersexualized youth? Or how can I further contribute to a culture of building consent and mutuality and healthy relationships? Um, so I, I think that one of the things we need to do is we need to start naming it for what it is. And in the fear-based, the rescue-based tactics, those of us in the movement and those of us who have an opportunity need to get up and say, yeah, we're not doing this rescue thing anymore, right? We open doors, we provide opportunities. But the thing that we all have the power to do is work on those root causes. Poverty, sexism, racism, discrimination, better education, better employment access. Um, because if we realize that we're kind of all in this together, I think it's much harder to sit back and go, I'm totally fine, but I'm going to go rescue you. And advertise. And advertise. <laughs> can, I, can I just add a, a, can I add a piece to that? Um, I, I loved Leslie's answer, and I think it's spot on. Uh, what I will say is that it's, it's a tricky spot for the criminal justice system because we work on cases where uh, people actually do need to be rescued it, from a trunk of a pimp's car, from a hotel room where they're in, it, being held, uh, at gunpoint, you know, et cetera. This, this does have a side that is incredibly violent, incredibly um, dangerous. And so uh, I agree with everything that Leslie said, but I don't also want to forget that there are times when um, our law enforcement have to do things that are uh, extremely important. Uh, extremely fast acting and extremely dangerous and we have to um, I think keep that in the back of our mind about how far this problem can can go when it goes really off the rails last thing I know I mentioned it um, if you could come next Monday in Kent Senior Center it's about the cultural grooming forum would love to have you be part of the change Thank you, and thank you. Let's give a big th round of applause to our speakers.